And the title of today's message is, Who Are You Cheering For? And the scripture has been read very capably. And I want you to know that today I'm preaching about this attitude, this constantly lifting up, which became the signature of the Apostle Paul's style. Being happy for people when they succeed and when they do the right thing. You know, it's easy to become jealous and to become envious when you see other people serving God and when you see their victories. I wanna tell you a story and I've been told, especially by some of the ladies, that they really enjoy it when I tell stories about male-dominated things like football. So I found the story. I want to tell you a story about a man named Jalen Hurts. Hurts was the starting quarterback at Alabama during his freshman and his sophomore seasons. Roll Tide. Roll Tide. And he compiled a 24-2 to record. And then on college football's biggest stage, which happens to be the national championship game, he was benched at halftime. His backup quarterback, Tuo Tagovailoa, went into the game and led Alabama to a comeback victory and a national championship. So what did Jalen Hurts do? Well, he supported Tua Vaglia and he cheered him on. Then the following year, he returned to Alabama and he was the backup, a demotion. And before he was able to sub for an injured Tua in the SEC championship game, he sat on the bench a lot. But when he got up for that SEC championship game, he led the team to a comeback victory. Just because he supported the team and he cheered for them, even when he wasn't the one who was leading the team, even when he wasn't a starter, didn't mean that he stopped competing, didn't mean that he uh, didn't want a starting spot again, and when the time was ready, God made him ready. Amen. Not only did Jalen Hurts embody the Apostle Paul's mindset for his teammates and for the fans, but throughout all of that media, and I saw a great deal of this because at the time I have a producer who's a big Roll Tide fan and my husband's a big uh, Alabama fan, so I was kind of forced to watch these games. Uh, there was a lot of, lot of talk going on by the media about these great comebacks and about this spirit of Jalen Hurts. And that's why it's no surprise to me that when he came back the next season, he was welcomed back by all of the fans, even though he had gone away for a while. And there is a message today and I don't know who God is sending this message to. He may be sending it to everybody here in the sanctuary and online, or he may just be sending it to you. So I want you to hear what doth saith the Lord. Paul was in prison when he wrote this letter. Now, I don't think there's any greater desire in the human heart than for freedom. So Paul was literally not physically free. So when I think about Paul writing four letters, and you have to uh, spend a little time with God to know what I'm talking about, I think uh, how it's amazing to me that he was so full of love and so full of gratitude when he was writing these letters from the darkness of a prison cell, often facing execution. And yet he was encouraging the people First at Ephesians, in Ephesus, then in Philippi, which is where today's scripture comes from, then in Colossae, which is where Colossians comes from, 
and then also in Philomen. And if you took my uh, challenge on Tuesday night's Bible study, you have read the book of Philomen, which is the third shortest book in the Bible. And if you weren't here on Tuesday, I challenged everyone to read the five shortest books of the Bible in 15 minutes. And I got emails back. I will tell you this. A lot of people did it. But the winner is Evangelist DeMaio, who beat my record of 15 minutes with 12 minutes. Just have to give credit where credit is due. <laughs> Paul never feels sorry for himself if you read these letters. Never does he ask for sympathy or for really anything at all. Instead, he uses these letters as a way of encouraging the people that lived in these cities and that started these churches. And what's even more incredible is that Paul has a way of cheering people on, even people who are outside where he is. He was never bitter. He prayed that, that they would have grace and peace. He never prayed for his own grace and peace. And he always reminded them that God was for them. And so was he, obviously. Even from a prison cell, he served them with all these loving words. And you've heard the scripture, but I, I want to read that same scripture from Eugene Peterson's Message Bible for you, because I think there's a clarification that I needed to read in this version. Every time you cross my mind, I break out in exclamations of thanks to God. Each exclamation is a trigger to prayer. I find myself praying for you with a glad heart. I am so pleased that you have continued on in this with us, believing and proclaiming God's message from the day you heard it right up to the present. There has never been the slightest doubt in my mind that the God who started this great work in you would keep at it and bring it to a flourishing finish on the very day Christ Jesus appears. What a promise. It's not at all fanciful for me to think this way about you. My prayers and hopes have deep roots in reality. You have, after all, stuck with me all the way from the time I was thrown in jail, put on trial, and came out of it in one piece. All along, you have experienced with me the most generous help from God. He knows how much I love and miss you these days. Sometimes I think I feel as strongly about you as Christ does. So this is my prayer, Paul says, that your love will flourish and that you will not only love much, but well. Learn to love appropriately. You need to use your head and test your feelings so that your love is sincere and intelligent, not sentimental gush. Live a lover's life, circumspect and exemplary, a life Jesus will be proud of, bountiful in fruits from the soul making Jesus Christ attractive to all, getting everyone involved in the glory and the presence of God. I needed that. That ministered to me for the last couple of weeks that I was immersed in preparing this message, that people often ask me, how do I know what my gift is? And how do I hear God Tell me what my gift is. And I tell them often that you will never have a question when God speaks to you about your gift. That what you need to do is stay in prayer and be quiet. Be still and let him tell you. And the way God has always shown me my gifts is by allowing me to do something that I didn't believe I could do. Without him... 
I can't do very much. So when I think about my gifts, which may be the gift of teaching in my case, may be the gift of preaching, whatever those gifts are, the way I know that God intended them for me is when they are not effortless, but when all the effort manifests itself. I have to study to show myself approved. But unless God comes in, and unless I bring him in from the very start, nothing I do will show the gift. Because the gift is from the gift giver. I'm just the recipient. Amen. And Paul was an encourager. That was his gift. I know people who have that gift. I wish I had that gift. I wish that in spite of what I see with my earthly eyes, that I could see with my spiritual eyes the fact that everybody needs to be cheered on, that all people need to be encouraged, no matter how good it looks like their life is going. Because people get all consumed by what you own and how you speak and where you went to school and what kind of relationship you have with your significant other, all of these things, which really when you come right down to it, I don't think God is all that concerned with that stuff. God is concerned with my heart. He's concerned with whether or not I am able to obey the only commandment that's left, okay? We got rid of the laws of the Old Testament we no longer pay much attention to the Ten Commandments that Moses brought down to the people. So Jesus made it as easy as he could for us. He said, the only commandment is that you love one another as I have loved you. And yet this is the hardest thing for all of us. And it's seen, in my opinion, most often when we fail to be happy about other people's triumphs. When we hold on to this notion that I deserved that, why did they get blessed? What are they doing that deserves such a reward? Instead of asking the really important question, what am I not doing? What am I missing? Amen. What have I stopped doing? What have I allowed the world to tell me isn't necessary? And there have been periods in my life when I can tell you the world's message was louder than the scripture because I was paying more attention to it. And I would retreat from my studies and I had all kinds of worldly excuses for it. I was too busy raising children, then I was too busy building a career, then I was too busy maintaining that career, then I was too busy accumulating things. All of these things would take my focus off of him and put it out there on the world. And so much to my chagrin, during those periods, although I was able to amass all kinds of things on the outside, there was this emptiness on the inside. Because that can only be filled by God. And if you're not giving time to God, then guess what? That emptiness will get larger and deeper, and it will be very difficult for you to overcome it. So not only did it occur to me that, that Paul had this gift, the gift of being an encourager, but he also had this natural human desire because he was just a man after all, and a man who, by the way, had at one point in time persecuted believers. So I, I wondered what it was that kept him pouring out this love in spite of the fact that they had their freedom and he did not. Because it occurred to me then, and it occurs to me all the time, particularly when I take any ministry into the jails and prisons, that there are people right now inside of jail who are freer than you may be here on the outside. Amen. There are people out in the world right now, 
particularly during the last couple of years, who are in bondage. They're in bondage to fear. They're in bondage to what other people say. They're in bondage to rules and regulations that they dare not question. They're in bondage to the world. And I believe that for a man to be so full of love or for a woman to be so full of love that they show humility and self-control in the worst of circumstances enables them to go out in the best of circumstances and it to be about him and not about them. Amen. And this is my, my journey, which I will you know, share with you because God has literally awakened me in the middle of the night to remind me when I forget that my responsibility is that anyone who has an encounter with me, whatever that encounter may be, it could be business, it could be uh, a teaching exchange, it could be just passing through the lane at Publix and the cashier and I having an interaction. Whatever interaction I have with people, if they don't see the God in me, then I have failed. If they are not drawn to the Spirit of God, then I didn't deliver. Amen. And no matter how much studying I do, no matter how many prayers I pray, and no matter how many sermons I preach or lessons I teach, the bottom line is every interaction matters to God. He doesn't think more of Pastor Jay than he thinks of Mama Jay. He doesn't think more of me when I'm teaching a Bible study than he thinks of me when I'm just having a telephone conversation with somebody who's in pain. The same love that he has for me in the best of times is the same love he has for me in the worst of times. And until I'm able to feel that way about all of my brothers and sisters, those in Christ and those out of Christ, because I have noticed that something that has happened to the church is that we have decided that we don't have a responsibility to talk about these things with the unbelievers. Maybe my most important responsibility is to live a life in front of the unbelievers, which get them to question me as to what it is that's so different. And trust me, I go into encounters, even the most mundane encounters, like, you know, you know you're going to have to wait in a waiting room and you go to the, uh, the eye doctor's appointment or, or when you go to, you know, certain other things where there's a line or a queue that you have to get into. And during those times, when the frustration starts to rise in me and the anger starts, and I happen to be a person who, who one of my major character flaws is patience, right? So when that stuff starts to come up in me, I can do nothing except ask God for help. Amen. And when I walk into these situations now, before I cross the threshold, my prayer is consistently the same. God, let me be a representation to who's ever in that room of who you are to me. Let them see you in me. Because if they can see you in me, they're going to want to know you. And if they want to know you, then I can tell them where to find you. You know, I know where you are, Lord. So help me to become the directional to you. Lord, I... I'm not about impressing people anymore. I had those times in my youth where, you know, fame and, and, and all those things mattered. You know, that has passed. You know, I'm grateful. Thank you, Lord. That now I only seek the glory for God. You know, if he gets the glory and he uses me to get it, that's okay. You know, because ultimately I only care really about what he thinks of me. Amen. You know, the world really doesn't like me that much. I don't like anybody that much. People in the, in the world right now can't get along with each other. If they have a difference of opinion, they get into fights. 
Families have fallen apart. Friends have stopped being friends. There are some people you can no longer, I, I don't do this, but I've heard they'll unfriend you on Facebook. You know, they'll block you on their phone. You know, people are so uh, involved in this battle. That's the devil. And I can't get, let the devil drag me into those fights. I have to remember what Paul said. He said, we should never be bitter. We should pray for grace and peace for the other. I know how hard that is. Trust me, I know how hard that is. As I said, an encourager is not something that I would put a check by in my list of character traits. As a matter of fact, I would put it under the list of character defects uh, along with patience. And we all have them. But the beauty is Christ had none of them. So when Christ is in me, and I allow someone to see the Christ in me, doesn't matter what Joyce thinks, doesn't matter what Joyce says, because he will give me the power to overcome the wickedness of the world. Amen. And I can only speak for myself, but my desire at this point in my life is to serve God in a way that's pleasing to God and to maybe bring someone to the understanding that he's there for them. And how do you do that? If, if locking Paul up didn't keep him from cheering other people, what is your excuse? We're not locked up. Well, we were on lockdown for a while, but even on lockdown, we had all kinds of ways to interact. And if you were a member of the Solid Rock, we never missed a day at this church. Locking him up did not keep him from being an encourager, from cheering people on. And here we are sitting in the house of God. And my question to you is, who are you cheering for? There are three very important lessons that we can learn from this. One is that every victory, every victory becomes our victory. Stop thinking about what you did and what they did. And start thinking about how the corporate purpose for which Jesus came and died Amen. is our going out there and winning souls for his kingdom. That's it. This is not hard stuff. You know, we should see any gains in the gospel, anyone who's elevated in ministry, anyone who's doing God's work and maybe occasionally getting credit for doing God's work and maybe getting elevated in front of you, maybe before you. We should see that as our victory because that's the mentality that Paul had. He, he would write letters to these churches and he didn't, you know, he didn't tell them, oh, I wish I was there doing this. And if I was there, we'd be doing it differently, you know, which is always my first tendency, right? It's like, oh, they're doing a good job. But if I were leading, Amen. we might be doing it this way. No, no, no. Paul never says that. He says, I pray that you continue to do your very best and that you allow God to complete the work that he began in you. He just keeps encouraging them. The second thing that we learn is that every loss should become our loss. I find that people, even people in the church, run away when there's some loss. When people walk into a church, my expectation is that they may very well be broken and they may be hurting. That's why we refer to this as a ministry that reaches out to the lost and the lonely and the abandoned. That's what church is for. Church is not a place, although I love, you know, getting dressed up and singing praises and, and all of the other parts that, are, uh, that go along with my church experience. I come to church more than any other reason because I know there may be someone in there who just needs a kind word. Someone who just needs to be heard. Amen. I watch people come into the church 
and they're like stone statues. They don't interact. They don't want to hear it if you're, you know, upset. They're uncomfortable if you're experiencing grief or loss. They're the last person to come up and tell you, I, I, I feel, t- you know, so much for you. I know how difficult this must be for you. Even if I ha- it hasn't happened to me, I can only imagine how you feel. And if there's anything I can do for you, please let me know. I wish I heard that in the church more. Instead, what a lot, and less at this church than at others, but I've gone to other churches so I can speak from experience. More often what I'll hear is people gathering away from the person grieving and saying, I don't know what's wrong with them. They need to just get uh, you know, more involved in uh, Bible study, and, and, and they're obviously not doing something, and perhaps they haven't repented, and look at their lifestyle. Wow, that's not supposed to happen in the church. The church is a place for us to encourage one another, not belittle one another, not gossip about one another, Amen. not tell other people your business. You know, people who are close to me will tell you, If they tell me something, they're not going to hear it coming from somebody else. As a matter of fact, when somebody else then tells them what they had originally told me, and they often say, didn't, and this happens even with, with, uh, with Pastor Billy and I, and they'll say, didn't Pastor Billy tell you? Or they'll say to Pastor Billy, didn't Pastor Jay tell you? No. What you tell me is between you and me and God. If you want somebody else to know, go tell them. I'm not going to tell them. Even in the cases where I believe it's fundamentally important that Pastor Billy knows something, I'll go back to the person and say, you really need to talk to Pastor about this. Not, uh, you know, oh, let me tell you what I know. This goes on in the church. I find that absolutely uh, catastrophic. It's why people don't go to church. It's why people church hop from one church to the other. They have a bad experience over here, they go to this church. Then they have a bad experience over here, and they go to this church. The church should be the safest place you go to. When you go to church, you should know that all the saints of God inside that building at this moment are on your side. They're encouraging you. They know that what you need is right here in the Word. If they do anything, it's to send you to the word or to send you to the pastors. Competition in the kingdom should become offensive to you. It should be seen as a loss. And I I get it. I know. You know, but if you break down another believer or you talk down another believer, that's a mark on the whole church. Okay. We're not, uh, we're not alone in this. We're a corporate body. And not just this church. We're a corporate body with all churches. And what we need to do is be mindful and and remember the essence of Paul, that, that he had this, he had a burning love for Jesus. That's what I want. As Francis Chan says, I want to be crazy in love with Jesus. Because when you have that crazy love going on, you can't hide it. You get that Sunday morning feeling and you can't hide it. And that's the kind of love that I have. And yet I still fall short. I am not mindful all the time of how someone else needs a word of encouragement. And there are those times when I look and I think to myself, but I'm, I'm trying so hard, Lord, and, you know, I, I've repented, and I'm, I've changed, Lord, and I've done all these things. How come they're getting blessed? And God always reminds me, if someone next to you is getting blessed, your blessing's on the way. Amen. That means that it's about to leave uh, that person and come over to you, because that's the way these things are. Blessings will go right down the rows of the church, right across the aisles, right outside that door into the community that you go talk to. Because if that's not happening, 
it's because you begrudge the blessing that the other person got. I've seen blessings cut off in mid-sentence, so to speak, because people have been jealous of somebody else's blessing. And I try to remind them, God's in the blessing business. What's hers is hers, and what's yours is yours. You can't have my blessing, and I can't have yours. So why would I begrudge you your blessing? I just look at you, and I want to get closer. Let's see if I can stand a little bit closer so that when that blessing spills off them, it spills right onto me. That's the attitude that the church needs to have. And the final part of the lesson, really, is that love doesn't come naturally to us. And that sounds strange, doesn't it? Because if you've ever had that romantic feeling come upon you, like the first time I saw Pastor Billy, that seemed pretty natural. It just came over. But actually, love is not that feeling. And Pastor talk, talks about that all the time. That's something different. Uh, lust, basically. Love, as he describes it, is a decision Amen. that I make. And there may be, uh, that may never have occurred to you before. But I can point out where you see this most obviously. Just look at the behavior of people, including people whose Facebook picture is Jesus or who has a line of scripture in their signature and then you read their posts and all you see is people fighting, carrying on, being spiteful and negative. Do God a favor and take the scripture off your Facebook page or your email signature if you're going to behave like that. That tells the world that your struggle is in the flesh and that Satan has a hold of you and that you think that by putting a picture of Jesus on your uh, Facebook page that somehow people won't realize that you're one of the devil's minions. Yeah. Um, maybe the biggest reason that we struggle so much with cheering for other people is because we try to force that love. You know, we think like, okay, I'm going to read uh, the, the whole book of Philippians tonight, Lord, so that you can work this out in my spirit, Lord. Or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read, uh, you know, Second John, Lord, whatever it takes, Lord. I'm going to do the work so that I can do the loving. Forget about it, okay? There's only one, re one way that you can become an encourager and that you can show the love of Christ, and that is to ask him to help you. Yes. You can't do it without him. I can't do it without him. I have to ask him every day, Lord, take me out and you come in. Allow me to be a vessel and fill me up with the Holy Spirit so that that love that I'm trying to show to other people and that I seem incapable of showing to other people, you will show to other people. You're just going to use me to do it. Amen. I have to empty myself out completely and invite him to take over completely or cheering for others just won't happen. It just will not happen in my life. Not without the core Jesus love. I'm just not that good. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm just not that good. We can rejoice with people, even in our lack, only if we have the abundance of love of God in us. It will not come naturally. As much as I'd like to believe that I read enough scripture and I've uh, prayed enough prayers that I can go out into the world, that I can walk out of these doors this morning and that I will be a living example, a testimony to God's goodness. But maybe sometimes before I even reach the car door, something will come over me and I'll be in the flesh and I'll be struggling to mind my tongue. My, my prayer quite often during my prayer circle in the morning is, Lord, guard my tongue. Lord, don't let me say the first thing that comes to my mind because that is the flesh. When I wait a moment, then God takes over and the words that come out of my mouth 
are pleasing because they're his words and not mine. So I believe that we have it in us to cheer for another person. I think it's, um, and that's kind of a beautiful thought, right? I believe we have God in our bones. And if he's in my bones, then I should be able to let him seep out of my mouth, to seep out of my smile, to actually come out of my pores, you know? And, and that's most evident when someone else gets honored or someone else gets blessed. See, when the honor is being lavished on me or the blessing is coming my way, it becomes very easy to stay self-centered and not God-centered. It's also easy when the honor and blessing is going to someone else. So I, I say to myself, when I see somebody getting blessed, somebody, uh, you know, uh, gets, gets a party thrown for them, you know, I, I, I saw a friend of ours had sent us a, a text message the other day that said, my wife is going to be throwing a 60th birthday party in my honor. I really want you and Pastor Joyce to be at that party. And I'm, I'm, look, one thing I am with you is honest. And my first feeling as I'm looking at this is, how come nobody thought to throw me a party on my 60th birthday? And then I say, Dev, I rebuke you, Satan, get thee behind me. And I wrote back a text, I would be honored to be a, at your birthday. Amen. And then he, they wrote back, don't bring any presents. Presents are unaccepted. I said, don't worry. I was just planning to put a bow on Pastor Billy. <laughs> That was my, the gift that I was bringing, you know. And, and that's it. I, once I allowed that ugliness, I, I, I admitted it to God. I said, oh, my God, why did I think that? What a horrible thing for a child of God to think when they see this beautiful email. God, forgive me. Change me, Lord. Take away those first thoughts and allow my first thought to be, what would Jesus do? You know, and once that was done, once I have had that transformation and that renewed mind, I feel joy in the other person's gain. You know, I don't just accept it. I'm like happy about it. And I'm thinking about how I can make that day even more special for that person who looks at me as a child of God. And I don't want that to change. I don't want to be viewed by anybody, whether they're in the church or out of the church. Because again, I tell you, stop thinking that the only people you're supposed to be ministering to are the other people inside the church. You need to be ministering to the people out there who don't know God's grace and don't know God's mercy, even if it's only a smile, a word of encouragement. Amen. There are so many people, you know, I, I, I'm reminded a couple of months ago, the pastor and I were at this uh, men's clothing store, which now all the guys go to, um, K and G, right? And we're in there, and there's this young man, and he's trying to help pastor to find a suit, except the styles of suits have changed dramatically, right? And pastor likes a long overcoat and long pants with a cuff on the bottom, and that's like not really the style anymore. No offense, pastor. Okay, so pastor's going through the rows and going through the rows, and, and he's having a tough time finding. And this young man took it upon himself to look through every single suit till he could find suits that lined up with what pastor wanted, provided him with a couple of selections, and then said he understands how pastor feels and he he want, you know he hears a lot of older men saying that and he feels terrible that their needs are not getting met and the 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 magic happens in those moments when pastor says well what do you want to do with your life and he says well i'd really like to manufacture suits that other people like you know instead of the same stuff that everybody else is wearing and pastor prayed for him right there. We prayed for him right there, that God would move in his life and that he would be able to start his own company and do his own thing. I mean, he was maybe a 21, 22-year-old man. But that's an encourager. That's instead of saying, 
because because really everybody else in that position just goes like, yeah, I don't understand why, uh, you know, K&G doesn't serve us. You know, we're the population that has money. That's the stuff that comes out of the world's mouth. But what came out of Pastor's mouth was, young man, I see a future. I see you're compassionate. I see you understand what I'm asking. And I see you want to meet my need. I pray that God puts that business, brings it to life, births it in you. That's an effort. That's a decision that you make when you're confronted with things. Am I going to belittle the person, yell about the injustice being done to me, or am I going to encourage that person to help them and to help me? And if you look at the kind of church that I envision all the time, it's in the Word. All you got to do is go to the book of Acts and the second chapter. And you look at verses 42 through 47, I won't read them all to you, but it's about how we continue steadfastly and that we break bread together and that we pray together. So when I look at my list of the solid rock, I go, hmm, pray, check, break bread together, check. I go down the list of what I think is important about the church, what I want today's church to be like. It's the church that's described in the second chapter of Acts, that they sold their possessions <laughs> and they sold all their goods so that they would able, be able to take care of the needy. That's a powerful message that somebody in here needs to hear today, that the church is not supposed to have individuals who have it all and individuals who have nothing at all. The church is supposed to make sure that everyone is taken care of. And the way we do that is in the form of tithes and offerings and charity. And if you have been blessed and you have abundance and you don't consider yourself a blessing depot and you don't send those blessings out wherever they are needed, trust me, your blessings will be taken from you one way or another. So be mindful that you are interacting with the church as the church described in the second book of Acts, that you break bread with one another, that you share what you have with one another, and then the Lord will add to your church. Things will happen that the only way you can explain them, but God. But God. You know, when, when we ha are presented with problems, and whenever you maintain anything, whether it's a business or a building or a, a home, expenses will come up. You know, and when we find out that we need a new roof, we don't start some fundraising drive. We need a new roof. Everybody's got to, you know, step up and make sure that we get this new roof. We trust God. And he always provides. Not sometimes, not most of the times, always provides. We'll get a new roof this week, okay? We, we, uh, we, we walk, walk around, well, Pastor in particular walks around and he's constantly deciding what needs to be done, what needs to be cleaned, what needs to be fixed. And, and you know, that's, that's the church. That's the church's responsibility. And yet, you don't hear us. Really, you don't hear us. The only time we ever specifically ask for a particular sum for something, it's to support the church in India. The rest of the time, I'm trusting God. I'm trusting God that he'll show up in your tithes and he'll show up in your offerings. And if he doesn't show up in your tithes and your offerings, guess what? Somebody on the outside will bless us. And if you don't believe that, you look at the the you know, $15,000 marble lion that's sitting out there. <laughs> if you think that that came out of your envelopes, <laughs> no. Amen. There are blessings that come from the outside because we're serving God. And that's why I say <coughs> we need to encourage one another. We need to build one another up. We need to flip the script. 
We need to decide what our definition of the church is. And as I said, go look at Acts in the second chapter where it said, the talents and gifts were cheered by all. Abundance was shared by all. No one was jealous of what anyone else had. So we'll see the church differently, the home church, the mega church, the small intimate congregation like ours. These are all just preferences, okay? For far too long, we have focused on the church structure. But issues of the heart aren't solved by the square footage of the church. Issues of the heart are not solved by what kind of light fixtures there are in the church. Jesus doesn't care about those things, doesn't care about the aesthetics. He wants us to do the best that we can with what we have to keep it clean and to keep it serviceable. But he is not impressed by auditoriums and and big, big, big. That's not what God is looking for. He's looking at our hearts. We can change. I want us to change. To be honest, I want us to deal with character issues. And one of those is better discipleship. And it starts with leaders. It starts with those of us sitting up here. It starts with the deacons and deaconesses. And I want to change. I want to cheer people on. I want to become an encourager like Paul. The hard good of this, when I say hard good, it's because you got to fight the devil all the time for this to happen, is a lesser of a hard experience than if I miss it completely. The impact on who I am going to become and who you are going to become is monumental when you change the way you think about who you are in this kingdom. The heart issues that die the hardest are often the quiet, nagging places that God has been dealing with you for a long, long time, and you have refused to answer. Today's Sunday School was about hearing the call. And I'm here to tell you that entitlement and jealousy and bitterness and a failure to be an encourager to other members of the church, that's part of your past, okay? That's your past. Love, in which everybody's win is our win, that's your future. Cheering for others is entirely possible for me and for you. It'll change you for the better. It will keep all of the bitterness from breaking you down. It will honor God who will honor us back. And if that sounds hard or feels uh, uh, unaccomplishable, I don't even know if that's a word, please remember that the harder the road, the better the human you're going to become. And so I close this message this Sunday morning by asking you, who are you cheering for? Who are you sharing with? And let's see if we can pattern our lives, our church lives, after the early church in Acts, the second chapter, and see what God does. Because see, I believe, like Paul believed, that if I cheer for the church, if I cheer for each and every one of you and you cheer for me, that God himself and Jesus himself and the Holy Spirit himself, the Trinity, is cheering for the solid rock. And if God be with us, who can be against us?